Well, it's 10 o'clock, so I think we will get started. Still a few people joining us, but that's great. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mary Collier. I'm the Professional Development Program Manager at the Ontario Museum Association, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar about reopening museums safely with the Public Services Health and Safety Organization. Um, as an organization of provincial scope, the Ontario Museum Association recognizes that its members and communities live and work on the lands and territories of Indigenous peoples. Toronto, where the OMA offices are located and where I'm speaking um, to you from today, is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, and Huron Wendat. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This territory is also uh, covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. So as you participate today, we invite you to reflect on the land that you're on, um, who the traditional keepers of the land are, and what the treaty relationship is, or if you're on unceded territory. And we wish to express our gratitude for the resources that we're using and pay respect to the rich and ongoing Indigenous history of what is now Ontario and Canada. So thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I hope everybody is doing well and ready for a really interesting conversation. Um, today's webinar will be one hour. We'll begin with a bit of an introduction and then I'll pass it over to our presenters. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask some questions after the presentation. Um, then I'll make some quick announcements and we'll wrap up around 11 a.m. Um, so I just want to start by making sure everybody knows how to participate today. So you'll see the slides as you do now, and you'll see and hear the presenters speak. Um, if you'd like to send a question to the speaker, now I know we have the Q&A enabled, but if you could actually use the chat instead, that would be great. Um, we will, uh, and you can access that at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the chat to just say hello to, to folks in the call and introduce yourself. Um, and yeah, there are some automated closed captions. If you need to access those, you can um, do so by clicking the CC button at the bottom of the screen. So we are recording today's webinar. And so you will receive um, a link to the recording as well as the slides um, from today's presentation after the webinar concludes. So I am very pleased to introduce our speakers today, um, Rob Oliver and Janice Gallant. Um, Rob has been a health and safety professional in Ontario for over 25 years, primarily working in government and education sectors. He currently works as a health and safety field consultant with the Public Services Health and Safety Association, serving education, museum, and library sector clients in central and eastern Ontario. And during the pandemic, Rob has been primarily working with various provincial ministries to assist them with their preparations for returning to in-person service. Janice is a registered nurse and certified registered safety professional with over 30 years of experience. She's an education and culture sector health and safety consultant at the Public Services Health and Safety Association and has worked as an occupational health nurse, um, health and safety manager and a health and safety consultant in a variety of public and private organizations. And she has assisted various clients in the completion of their COVID-19 risk assessments and development of safety plans. So we're in very good hands today and I would like to pass it over to Rob to get started. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Mary, for the introduction. I am just going to uh, start to share my, my screen here. Um, just want to make sure that you're going to see the correct one. Yep, we can see your slide. You, you can see the health and safety information for museum reopening, Mary? Right. Wonderful. Listen, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to, to chat with you this morning. Uh, it, it, it's a great privilege to, to speak with the Ontario Museum uh, Association uh, uh, representatives. Um, th this obviously is a, uh, a subject that uh, is at the top of everyone's mind these days. Um, and uh, and it, 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 it's, it's nice to be able to come and share information related to the, uh, the province's uh, step three 
uh, rules and requirements around reopening. And what we're going to be talking about today uh, are, are specific for uh, museum uh, organizations. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have been provided with uh, a number of questions that your members have provided to us uh, in, in preparation for, for the presentation here this morning. And so uh, I, I just want to comment that uh, what we've tried to do is, is put this presentation together to address the issues that were provided to us in uh, a lot of the questions that, that, that were provided by, by your membership. And uh, it, you know, following the the presentation here this morning, we'll have a little bit of a Q and A session. And I just wanted to extend uh, the offer that if there is anything in particular that we have not had the opportunity to address during this uh, during this presentation, then Janice and I are both um, uh, available uh, to uh, to respond. To, to any questions or or concerns or issues that 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 you may individually be 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 dealing with uh, with with your particular location. So the goal of the presentation here today is to provide information to support a healthy, safe, and successful reopening of museums. What we're going to do is we're going to focus primarily on what the province has. Uh, included in their legislation around step three, which is the current step that uh, the province is in related to COVID restrictions, uh, reopening requirements. Uh, and we're gonna focus obviously on museums. We're gonna be talking about different protective strategies and resources and and and, and things that, that you as, um, uh, it, managers and keepers of the, these locations and the museum locations in the province can actually resource and 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 take advantage of to ensure that when you are back up and running and you are open again for uh, for public visitors for clients coming in that you are doing so in in a very safe and 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 healthful way uh, as and obviously as well as complying with what the the province uh, is essentially mandating with with uh, uh, the various legislations that that are in place right now and uh, we will uh, be talking about that so <clears throat> the piece of legislation uh, that I'm going to be talking about is it's an Ontario regulation uh, 364, and these are very detailed rules for, uh, it says areas, but essentially it's different types of workplaces at step three of, of the reopening. And there is a particular schedule that is attached to these rules um, that relates specifically to museums. And that's what, what we're going to be uh, going over here this morning so that everybody has an idea of what is expected, what is required, what is safe. In the, the schedule, there are there's information around general compliance. We need to know about capacity limits. So how many people from the general public are allowed within our indoor space. There are certain requirements that, that apply to uh, individuals. So people who actually come to uh, your museum, your, your attraction, whatever it may be, they have to follow certain requirements as well. And we're gonna talk about that. Physical distancing, facial coverings, things like that when people are queuing. So people who are in line, uh, there are requirements there. Um, cleaning requirements, that was something that uh, we received a couple of questions on. Um, some of the other items here relate to the requirement to post uh, signage, um, the issue of screening uh, employees and volunteers, we'll talk about that, and <clears throat> requirements for PPE is personal protective equipment. 
uh, when individuals are within six feet or, or two meters of one another. It's no different than if you were to go to Walmart or Costco or wherever. Uh, and also there's this requirement of a safety plan. The organizations that are uh, opening and welcoming people back in stage three or step three, uh, they are required to actually prepare a written safety plan. And that's one of the, the, the things that we're going to be uh, talking about as well. So moving forward, the, the first issue here that is included in the regulations has to do with general compliance. And so all employers, and it's whether you're a museum, uh, a car company, uh, a, a retail outlet, there, there are certain requirements that all employers have to follow when it comes to um, dealing with the, with the, with the COVID uh, pandemic. Certainly one thing that has not changed is the requirement to comply with all applicable laws, including the Health and Safety Act. And the reason why that is significant is because one of the, the primary requirements uh, of employers that's outlined in the Act is that they have to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of their workers. And what is reasonable changes over time with something like COVID as we get new information, as we're given new directives. The benchmark or the measuring stick is what is reasonable in the circumstances. And because we're dealing with a very fluid, uh, well, obviously viral pandemic situation, those, what is reasonable eight months ago may not be the same bar as what's reasonable uh, in another six months as information changes and as circumstances change. We also have to make sure, and this is particularly relevant when it comes to uh, the, the COVID situation, P local public health officials, you're going to get the majority of your information and your direction from public health. It, it's either going to be from the, uh, the Ministry of Health at Queen's Park, the province, declaring things like step two, step three changes, things of that nature. But in a, from a local context, like depending on where you are in the province, you need to follow direction and instruction from your local public health authorities. And they're going to give you information based on your geography, uh, caseloads, um, infections, things like that, that are in your area that are relevant for, for employers in, in that space. And so <clears throat> that's where you're going to get ongoing up-to-date information around physical distancing, disinfecting, cleaning, and things like that. The, the issues of masking, all of those things, you'll get that information current and up-to-date from your own local um, uh, public health authority. And then obviously, employers have to comply with any any advice or recommendations that the uh, the chief medical officer uh, of health. So this is at Queen's Park. So this is the provincial uh, authority. Uh, so the second bullet point here is more dealing with local uh, issues, maybe in your own community. The third point here relates to province-wide. So these are some of the, the things that all employers, uh, regardless of, of, of what they do, uh, if they're going to be back in business, then they have to comply with 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 these with these things. Some of the other items that uh, all employers have to make sure that they have in place uh, signage is 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 key. You'll notice that anytime if anyone's been out in the last six or eight months, you'll know that when you go into any store or um, 
activity or, or, or anything that you do outside, if you're going to go into a space, there's likely, there should be signs. And that's something that as museums reopen and you're starting to welcome back clients, you'll have to make sure that you have signs that are posted at the entrance to uh, each of the the entrance doors that's well that are well is welcoming people back and it, it essentially the information there is telling people how they can they should screen themselves for COVID-19 and this is called a passive screening and so passive screening is when people will simply just uh, look at a series of questions. Have you been out of the country? Uh, have you been in contact with a close contact? Things like that. Um, and, 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 and they answer them themselves. That, that's considered passive screening. Employers, however, need to actively screen every person who works there uh, before they come in. All right. And so this applies to uh, employees as well as volunteers. And so the act of screening would be more along the lines of uh, a form that's filled in. Um, a lot of workplaces, depending on their size, they will have uh, a QR code uh, on, on an individual's phone um, that they would scan. And bef so before they go to work, they would answer the questions. And then when they get to work, I know Walmart does this, Home Depot does this. Um, so there's a record of them being, they have been screened before they start their shift. Other issues around general compliance for everyone is that employees have to wear a mask or face covering indoors. So this is during step three, or if they're in a vehicle and they have to ensure that it covers their mouth, nose and chin well they are in the indoor area and you'll notice here that janice and i have a an asterisk and there are exceptions to the requirement for wearing a, a facial covering uh, essentially medically medically related and 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 so those are those are things that uh, are those exceptions are also included in uh in in the regulations now, more specific for museums, there is a, a this Schedule 2, it talks about very specific rules related, like just to museums. It's Section 24. Um, and it talks about museum requirements, things that museums specifically need to do. It talks about the need for a safety plan. And again, this is a, this has to be a written plan where you've taken a look at the risk and you've identified different protective measures. So how are you going to address any of the risks? You need to identify indoor and outdoor capacities. And I'm gonna chat about that in, in a second. Sign, signs at the entrance, physical distancing, uh, including uh, different rides and tour vehicles. For any seated event, the, it is necessary, you have to have uh, a reservation system. So if you're holding a display, and we, we have a slide on this uh, shortly, if you're, if you're having a, an event or uh, a, a display that requires um, you know, people to be seated to watch a presentation or a demonstration of some sort, uh, you have to actually ensure that there are reservations made. Anyone who has gone out in, uh, you know, lately and, and tried to enjoy the um, restaurant industry since they've started to open up, uh, you, you know, you will, you will be very familiar with the requirement that uh, when you go there um, to take your table in, in the facility or in the building, wherever you're, you're going to be eating, uh, you have to give your name and a phone number. It, it's all for contact tracing. There, there needs to be a record. The same type of thing applies to museums. When we talk about museums, 
we're talking here, uh, I'm sure this is not news to anyone in our group here today, uh, but we're talking about galleries, aquariums, zoos, science centers, landmarks, historical sites, botanical gardens, and any other kind of similar attraction. So the regulation mentions museums. I think it says museums, et cetera. Uh, so the et cetera is, is all of these other um, types of uh, facilities. And we have highlighted here in, uh, in red, just an emphasis on the fact that whoever is responsible for that attraction, and this comes down to the responsibilities of the employer. Whoever is responsible for the attraction has to make sure that there is a safety plan that's been put together. And again, it has to be in writing. I'll be chatting a little bit about that shortly. The safety plan. It has to be prepared, written, posted, and it has to be available. And not just available for, uh, for staff members or volunteers, but also available for members of the public. Some places that I've visited over the last number of months, they have actually had signs up saying that our safety plan is available upon request. Um, and so uh, it, it is necessary that there is a, a, a written plan. Uh, and again, the things that would be included in the safety plan, and it has to be specific for that location, would be screening. So how are you screening employees and volunteers that come into work? And how are you screening uh, visitors? Physical distancing requirements, they need to be uh, uh, identified in there. The requirement for wearing mask or face facial coverings. Um, prevent gatherings or crowds at events. And so if there is going to be, uh, for example, an outdoor festival or some sort of a large gathering, uh, then there would be specific uh, protocols that you would put in place to, to deal with that. In your safety plan, you would want to make sure that there are there is information in there letting people know that gatherings and large crowds are not they're not um, uh, appropriate, they're not allowed, um, unless there are these certain circumstances that are put in place. Uh, and then any mitigation uh, of risk. And, and so this for the interactive activities, exhibits and games, the, the mitigation um, factors that we're talking about here would have to do with cleaning, disinfectant, di disinfecting, sanitization, uh, and, and things of that nature. And so how are you actually going to clean uh, and disinfect displays, interactive activities uh, throughout the day? Uh, and and we'll, we'll be chatting about that because I know that was actually uh, another item that we, uh, Janice and I received a, uh, a couple of uh, questions on. When it comes to indoor uh, space and how many people, how many members of the public uh, or clients, visitors are allowed in, it, the calculation, when they say 50% capacity or 75% capacity, you know, you'll see that in different signs and different places that you may go out in your community. Uh, it's all based on however the fire uh, code defines that. So uh, what we see here is the maximum occupancy load of the business or facility as calculated in accordance with the on, with this Ontario regulation, the fire code, um, under under this particular piece of legislation, this particular act. So at each at each location, you should have access to what is the maximum occupant load, and whatever number that is. When they say, for example, here, you'll see room capacity, and this is for museums, during step three, in any event, 
the number of members of the public permitted in any room cannot exceed 50% of the capacity. And so when they talk about the capacity, they're talking about the number that has been defined according to the fire regulations and your local fire department. Okay. And so um, the number of members of the public permitted to be in a particular room has to be limited to the number that can maintain a physical distance of two meters from each other and in any event, no more than 50% of whatever the capacity of the room is. People that are seated within an attraction, the number of members of the public seated in an event, 50% of the seating capacity for an indoor event, or 75% of the seating capacity if the event is outside. And then they have some maximums here, 1,000 and 1,500. Capacity limit signs have to be posted. This is one thing that I, I, I did a lot of work with uh, the um, Ministry of the Attorney General uh, a number of months back, assisting the courts in, in Ontario uh, before they were welcoming people back into their court system. And one of the things that was really critical is the fact that courtrooms and uh, any other you know, spaces within in, in the building, uh, they have to be limited with, or, or sorry, they have to be posted with a, a, a capacity limit sign. You, you, you can handwrite it, you can, um, you know, you can make it in Microsoft Word, it, but there has to be some indication before people go into the space of what the limit is. Uh, and again, it has to be in a conspicuous location, visible to the public that states the capacity limit. And that's something that's going to be necessary for any of uh, your museums that, that are going to be opening. The indoor capacity calculation uh, I, I mentioned was based on the fire code requirements. How many people does the fire code allow to be in the room? If it says 50%, then it's half that number. For those of you who have outdoor events, the, you calculate the outdoor capacity uh, a little bit differently. And basically you're just taking the, the square footage or the number of square meters that the public could, could be, uh, that they have access to, dividing it by a number um, and then rounding it down to, to the nearest whole number. Uh, and so that's essentially how you calculate um, the outdoor capacity. And one of the things I don't think that we mentioned at the start of our talk here today is that uh, this slide deck is going to be made available to everyone following the uh, our talk here this morning. And um, so if, again, if there are uh, if, 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 if people don't have an opportunity to, you know, jot down all these numbers or what have you, then you will be provided with uh, a PDF copy of, of, this, uh, of this slide deck. Here's the section here related to reservations. So it's not permittable for a member of the public to attend a seated event um, unless they have a reservation. And again, similar to my analogy earlier around um, restaurants, uh, it, it, the whole idea here has to do with contact tracing. If something should uh, develop down the road, uh, you may be a day or two down the road and you find out that there may have been perhaps uh, a suspected positive, then public health is gonna wanna know who may have been in contact or who is in the facility at that time. And so that's why it's required for the reservations. For anyone in our group today, I'm not sure if uh, amusement rides uh, are relevant, but if there are any indoor amusement rides, um, there is the physical distancing requirement of, of two meters from every other person on the ride. Uh, and it's except where necessary. So if people are paying and versus health and safety. 
Same thing goes with indoor tour, tour vehicles. So they have to be operated in a way that everyone there um, can maintain their physical distancing of two meters, uh, except where necessary. Again, facilitate payment for purpose, purpose of health and safety. The, now, the other thing is people that uh, visitors to these attractions who are from the same cohort, they're from the same household, the same bubble, uh, those are some of the words I'm, I'm sure we've heard. Uh, th there is not the requirement to, to uh, maintain the two meter separation. So if, uh, if a mother and father come with two of their children, then it's not necessary that all four of those people maintain two meters of separation, all right? They're within the same social bubble. So there are exceptions for that. Mask requirements for indoor and outdoor touring uh, vehicles and such. Every person who is on one of these amusement rides or an indoor tour vehicle has to wear a mask or face covering. So even if in that example of the four people from the same family, they may be able to sit beside one another while they're going through the attraction or they're on the, the, the ride or what have you, the vehicle. Uh, however, they still have to wear a mask or facial covering. And you'll see here, it also mentions these exceptions uh, around, uh, and again, they're, they're related to uh, more often than not medical type of situations. And here they are. So <clears throat> the mask or face covering exemptions. So individuals who come to your, your museum or your location, your attraction, uh, they are exempt. And, and this is, these are the same uh, exemptions for other industries in the province. And so if you're, for example, at a grocery store and there's an announcement reminding people that they can wear, they should wear, they have to wear a mask unless, unless there is an exemption or then these are the exemptions that they're talking about. So anyone who has a medical condition that is going to inhibit their, their ability to wear it, and they don't have to actually show a note from their doctor. Um, they need to express the fact that they have a medical condition and they are not able to wear a uh, facial covering. Any kids that are younger than two, people who aren't able to put on or remove their masks without somebody helping them, they're exempt. And people can actually temporarily remove their mask while they're inside. So for example, if you allow uh, eating and drinking in your establishment, like say again, restaurants, um, people sitting at the table do not have to have their face covering uh, on at that time. Uh, people engaged in athletic fitness activities. Um, some of the other things here that may be relevant for uh, our, our, our group of participants today, uh, is this one here, performing or rehearsing film, TV concert, artistic event, theater, or other performances. So if you have any live performances or live shows that are taking place at your location, it is not necessary for the performers to, um, to, to wear a facial covering while they're doing that. One of the other big ones, or actually two of the big exemptions, uh, have to do with the uh, AODA, Accessibility for uh, Ontario Ontarians with Disabilities Act, uh, or uh, Human Rights Code considerations. If someone performs work at your organization, and if they're in an area that members of the public are not able to get to, and they can maintain a distance of two meters from every other person in that area, then that is also uh, an exception, all right, to the mask or face covering. Live entertainment, I, I already mentioned this. Um, the only thing I didn't mention is the fact that the, the performers have to maintain 
uh, a physical distance of at least two meters from any of the spectators. So if you have a stage set up uh, and there is a performance going on, then the people in the front row, you know, they have to be at least two meters away from the people who are performing the, uh, performing the activity. Event spaces. A lot of this stuff we've we've already uh, we've already gone over. There has to be capacity limits that are established. So this is for meeting meeting rooms, uh, event spaces. Signage has to be posted. Physical distancing from everyone else in the room, two meters. Uh, table seating separated by at least two meters, or some sort of uh, plexi or uh, barrier, some sort of physical barrier, if that two meter separation is not uh, is not possible, and then actively screening people before they enter, uh, and and recording their name and contact information. So if you have space where you're renting or leasing out for meeting rooms uh, or event spaces, there needs to be a record of whoever comes to that space uh, it, as well as their contact information. And again, it, it, it goes back to this whole idea of, uh, of contact tracing. Now, cleaning requirements. Th this is something that we actually received uh, two or three different questions on. Um, what are the requirements around uh, cleaning? Uh, in, uh, you know, not just the museum location or the exhibit area itself, but also other types of interactive uh, devices where members of the public may be uh, coming in contact with. The, the requirements, uh, and this is verbiage straight from the, the regulation, it talks about the fact that washrooms and change rooms, showers, they have anything that's made available to the public in, in that sense, those types of areas. They have to be cleaned and disinfected as frequently as is necessary to maintain a sanitary condition. Similarly, any equipment that is rented to, provided to, or provided for the use of members of the public has to be cleaned and disinfected as frequently as necessary to maintain a sanitary condition. And these requirements apply to things like computers, electronics, touch devices that may be associated with interactive exhibits, things like that. Um, and you'll notice here that I have highlighted this phrase sanitary condition, because from a practical point of view, we may be wondering what does that mean like to maintain a sanitary condition? And so what they have done, there's no definition. I was not able to find a definition in any of the regulations or uh, any of the statutes around what, what is the definition of a sanitary condition. And so essentially it's left up to the employer to determine again, what is reasonable to maintain a sanitary condition. And if you just think of sanitary and what that word means, if you look up synonyms, you'll see things like clean, uh, germ-free, uh, th things along that nature. That, so, and that is what the benchmark is, okay? In terms of cleaning. May, and, and so depending on your facility and whatever your, uh, interactive displays are, it, it may differ from one location to another, depending on, on how busy the, your location is or what have you. I can give you an example from the courts again. Uh, anytime a witness takes the witness stand, uh, then they actually disinfect the, the, the witness stand and, and that before the next witness goes up and, 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 and takes their place. Um, so the courts have determined that that is as frequently as necessary between each user. Uh, that may or may not be the case with, with your particular location or the devices that you need to keep clean. 
but it pretty much is actually not pretty much it is it is left up to the employer to determine what works best for you to ensure that you're able to uh, maintain this sanitary clean hygienic germ-free condition uh, particularly related to hard surfaces Mention this, so specifically, again, in the regs, it specifically requires um, museum patrons have to wear a mask or face covering. And this is the point here in brackets, uh, uh, who is not from within their own house, household. So again, if you've got uh, a family of four coming, they're within the same social bubble. Um, uh, they, they don't have to maintain the two meters of separation, <clears throat> however, they, they do still have to wear the uh, wear the mask. I would imagine <clears throat> that some of your locations, having been um, out of service for for a number of months, uh, may experience some some lineups uh, when you when you start to reopen. You 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 may have a, a lot of people who are uh, trying to come and queue and get into into your facility. And so there are certain requirements in the regulations around lineups. And so you can't allow people to line up inside uh, your, your museum, your place of business, unless they are physically distanced, at least two meters apart and wearing a mask. And so this is why you will see in, again, grocery stores, big box stores, any place that you've gone out to that has allowed uh, customers to come in over the last number of months, it, you are more likely to see uh, markings on the on the ground, uh, ident like tape or pylons or what have you, marking off that two meter spacing. So people know before they come into your museum or your attraction that they are required to uh, maintain that distancing. And there's a note here, it doesn't apply to day camps uh, or overnight camps uh, for children. So protective strategies. So what can we do um, to reduce the potential of exposure? When it comes to uh, an organization, now depending on how large your, uh, your location is, uh, you may be able to modify the routine of employees. So staggering start times, breaks, and lunches, um, assigning staff to a specific cohort uh, to reduce the number of interactions. I've recently done a lot of work with uh, actually the city of Ottawa for some on-site training. And uh, in their water wastewater area, they have done this. They have divided their their workforce into two separate cohorts. And so they consider one to be one bubble and one to be the other. And then they do not schedule people from one cohort and the other to be working at the same time. So I, I, I do know that larger organizations are, are doing that. If you're dealing with face-to-face -face meetings with members of the public, then postpone, try and do a Zoom meeting, things of that nature, just to limit the face-to-face -face contact. Things for modifying the environment, physical barriers or other transparent barriers. And that's something that we've all seen over the last number of months uh, with different businesses where we've gone out. If you have reception areas uh, or any other spaces where staff are uh, stationary, they're seated, they're, they're performing their work, and they may have interactions with the public, uh, then transparent barriers are uh, an excellent thing to uh, implement there. Separate ent entrances for people coming in and people leaving. Separate entrances for staff. Uh, and again, visual markers on the ground, the wall, you know, wherever, where you're going to be um, pointing out either spacing requirements or arrow signs for routes of travel and unnecessary seating. So if you have waiting areas and things like that, uh, either tape off 
the the areas where um, you know you're not able to maintain that the two meter separation or just get rid of the seats uh, if they are portable physical distancing exceptions so this is the requirement to maintain two feet of separation so obviously if we are paying for something a member of the public we are going to be within two meters as we interact with the the person we are having our transaction with so the two meter separation is is uh, there's obviously an exception there but we have to make sure we're wearing a mask day or overnight camp they're exempt uh passing in hallways or aisles so in most office areas, uh, work that, that we've done with the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Education, a number of different areas where they have um, open office areas, employees doing clerical work where they have cubicles. Uh, they, they are not required to wear a mask while they're sitting at their cubicle. However, if they get up to go and use the facilities, then they have to wear a mask as they're moving about the, about the office uh, or, or what have you, because we can't guarantee that um, two meters of uh, separation. And for some of your, your locations, um, what I've just gone through now are requirements for museums. Now, however, each of these other areas or other sectors also have uh, specific requirements around uh, reopening, welcoming the public back, um, you know, in response to, to, to the COVID-19. Uh, and so th this is stuff that you, you, can, you can look up uh, um, following our, our talk here this morning. Uh, or you can reach out to, to Janice or I, um, and we can point you in the right direction. But, but all of these areas are um, available, that information is available in the regulation that is on the title slide for this, uh, for this presentation. Ventilation is likely to be an issue at, at some places, particularly uh, in older in older buildings, and uh, what the requirements are here, and you'll see we have actually referenced Public Health Ontario uh, with with what we're what we have on this particular slide. Uh, obviously, with COVID being an airborne uh, viral transmission, we want to make sure that our our air is as as clean as possible, and so whatever we can do to affect that is what we wanna, what we wanna try and do. And so we wanna make sure that we have a good functioning HVAC system. So heating, ventilation, air conditioning. And I know there are a, a lot of museum locations uh, in the province that are located in very old outdated buildings that may not have uh, air conditioning, or they may not, those types of systems. And so what we really want to try and do in those circumstances is we want to make sure that we're able to remove uh, and dilute the virus from the indoor air. So if we can open windows, if we can institute some sort of filtration process, and when we talk about filtration, we're talking about an air cleaner that a portable air unit that would uh, have very specific filtering specifications associated with it. And that's what we're talking about in the, the top bullet here on the, on the right uh, column. Uh, it talks about an HVAC filter, MERV 13 or higher. And MERV is the uh, minimum uh, uh, effective recovery, something or other. It, it, it runs from one to 16. And so basically the higher the number, the more effective it is at actually um, removing particulates from the air. And at a filtration rate of 13 or a HEPA filter, uh, you've probably heard of those, high efficiency particulate or arresting 
filters, they are capable of actually filtering out things in the air that are the size of a virus. So normally we think of a filter, or at least I always used to anyways, think of a filter as filtering out dust and pollen and things like that from the air. Some of these more highly specialized filters will are actually capable of removing particles from the air, including uh, viruses. And there are not to go through all of this on the on the chart here, but uh, ASHRAE is really the leading world standard uh, when it comes to setting um, parameters around indoor air quality. Uh, it's the association. Um, Oh, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning uh, Experts. And so it, those, those standards, uh, if you're looking at ventilation or things of air quality and you're concerned about that in your location, you'll want to take a look at whatever ASHRAE says uh, about that. It may be necessary to bring somebody in if you have concerns in your area around uh, the amount of airflow, uh, fresh air ventilation, air exchanges per hour, all that stuff. You, you may want to, to bring somebody in to take a look at it. Obviously, you can minimize the occupancy. You can, you can go below what the, the step three guidelines say uh, as far as how many people you're allowed to have in to your space if you're concerned about um, the, the you know the quality of the air, open windows and doors, using fans, basically to to encourage the movement uh, of air out. Um, you know, I'm just time sensitive here. There are a couple of slides. Portable air cleaners. This is what I was talking about uh, a minute ago around the uh, the HEPA filters. Um, public health again, and there's a reference on the slide, which you will have access to. Um, it, it talks about portable air cleaners being used as a supportive measure. Portable air cleaners do just that. They clean the air. They do not provide fresh air. They do not provide more oxygen. Uh, and so it's, it's, the di it's the difference between this last bullet point here, ventilation versus filtration. So if you have an installed ventilation system like you may have in your house, where you turn the thermostat and the air conditioning comes on and blows air out of a vent in your floor, that's ventilation. As opposed to filtration, which is taking the air in the room and it's filtering it, it's getting rid of uh, particles of certain sizes. And so there's obviously a lot more information on that. There's a slide that you'll, you'll see here around different policies that uh, you may want to consider putting in place when it comes to written documentation uh, around how you're, you're planning to, um, to operate uh, as you get back up to speed. Um, you may want to consider uh, for, uh, information for visitors. So like a frequently asked questions, uh, bullets, something along those lines for that either you would give as a handout, make a poster for the entrance to your museum, have on your website. But some of the things that are really common questions that, that people may have uh, before they actually come and visit your, your location. And so there are some examples here um, of, of things that you may want to include in a, an FAQ uh, poster or handout or what have you, uh, just so people understand before they show up at the front door, they understand what is required of them. You know, do they have to wear a mask? Do they have to be vaccinated? Things like that. The last points I just wanted to make before we uh, before I, I, I break off here uh, is the the issue of uh, responding to reports of symptoms. And so, if if you're working, if you're running a, a facility, you're running a, a museum location, and one of your employees um, or a member of the public comes and 
and tells you that you know they're not feeling well or what have you, then uh, they have to immediately be separated. They have to be like basically uh, separated, segregated from everyone else until they can go home. They shouldn't take public transportation. There's some guidelines here that we are providing. Um, public health guidance and things like that. Okay, so make, ensuring that the room is fully cleaned and sanitized, what have you afterwards. Some of the other things that um, I just wanted to mention here has to do with reportable um, situations, uh, disposable cleaning equipment. Okay, here we go. When it comes to uh, contact tracing, museums have to immediately report any suspected or confirmed cases within the museum. So any individuals who attended to your museum with a suspected or confirmed case, you have to notify your local public health department. And you have to give them any information basically that they ask for so that they're, they, they'd be able to do uh, the contact tracing and, and such. And so, again, just to reiterate, that's one of the reasons why it's necessary for any events that have reservations, you, you, want, you, you know who's in there uh, and contact information from them, uh, as well as employees and volunteers. So that's why it's more of a, an active screening for employees and volunteers uh, rather than passive to make sure that you 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 would have information uh, around um, reporting. Obviously, stay home if people feel unwell, self-isolation. Um, obviously, the supervisor needs to be informed because they ha they may have to uh, notify the Ministry of Labor, Training Skills Development. It used to be MOL. Now it's Ministry of Labor Training Skills Development and the WSIB. And so I think this is one of the last slides I'm gonna go over with you. Uh, but <clears throat> when it comes to reporting, should uh, you be made, made aware that someone was in your location with uh, confirmed or suspected, then uh, as per the Occupational Health and Safety Act, Employers have to provide written notice within four days uh, of when <clears throat> you're made aware that a worker, here we're talking about workers, has an illness from exposure in the workplace. All right, so this is just for workers. It's not for members of the public. If an employee or a volunteer comes to a supervisor and says, I have COVID, or I'm suspected, and I think I got it at work, then there are reporting requirements. Ministry of Labor needs to be notified. The Joint Health and Safety Committee or Health and Safety Rep at that location has to be notified. And if you're unionized, uh, the union has to be notified as well. And that's within four days. If it's something that, uh, again, if it's an employee, or uh, a volunteer, the employer or supervisor has 72 hours to uh, report it to the WSIB. And that's for um, workers' compensation benefits. So those are the, the main reporting requirements. And then just finally, uh, in terms of ongoing resources, I would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage everyone, please, go to these particular sites, all right? Uh, the first two or three, four, like anyways, avoid getting information through social media, contacts and things like that. If you want to know and understand what the current requirements are in the province of Ontario around welcoming people back into your uh, facility, you go to these sites, the government of Ontario, the Ministry of Labor site, Government of Canada, Health Canada site, Public Health Ontario. Um, our organization has a number of resources that are free uh, that are out there for, uh, for people. Uh, and again, in your 
material you're going to get, you're going to get links for for all of that information. So, um, anyways, with that, Mary, uh, I uh, I apologize for rushing through the last uh, few slides. Um, uh, but again, there's an, it's an awful lot of information, and uh, I, I, I hope that uh, we were able to provide you and your organization with something that you'll find useful. Great. Well, thanks very much, Rob. That certainly is a lot to digest. And I, I know yeah. Janice has been uh, keeping an eye on the, the questions that have been coming in. And as I said in the chat, we're going a little bit over 11 today. Um, but okay. if you have to sign off, um, all of the Q&A will be captured in the recording, so you'll be able to access that after the fact. So, um, Janice, did you want to uh, jump in at this point? Um, yeah, I guess the best way, uh, Rob, is uh, for me to just read the questions out and you can answer them uh, or okay, we can sure. answer them together. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so first question from Rhonda. Do capacity limits um, that need to be posted need to be for the entire facility? or for the specific rooms in the facility, for example, the gallery, the classroom, the gift shop? Yeah, it, it, that's a great question, Rhonda. Uh, the, the requirement there when it comes to uh, signage is that uh, there needs to be one for the entire facility, okay, like, like on the entrance door. And then if there are any other closed areas or spaces within that facility, like say a, like a meeting room, a boardroom, uh, a classroom, a gift shop, if they're within that facility, then there need to be uh, uh, specific capacity limits for those individual areas. Okay, second question from Kate. Uh, do visitors need to wear masks outside if they are seated in their own bubble? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, my understanding at this point is they should be wearing their, their masks uh, if it's an outdoor event uh, and they are seated. Um, I think it, it my, my assessment is that it needs to be encouraged. However, I'd have to go back and take a, uh, take a look at the actual regulation to see if it's, if it's uh, silent on that point. Um, and, and, and the reason, the only reason I, I that, that comes to my mind is because the, the regulations around museums are, are quite similar to the regulations around uh, outdoor sporting events. And uh, like, I, you know, just watching the Toronto Blue Jays a, a couple of days ago where they've allowed people back into the stadium, uh, th th there, I, I, I did notice in the stands, uh, most people were wearing a mask, but there were some who were not. Uh, so at that one there, I'm going to defer the answer to that question. I'm sorry, Kate. Um, I, my sense right now is it needs to be encouraged. Um, whether you can actually enforce it and ask people to leave uh, if they are not complying with it, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. All right, and we could um, look at that a little bit further with regards yeah. to just uh, circling back to the uh, regulation and uh, and then um, also looking at it from the point of view of e exemptions. Um, a question from David. Um, local public health unit Kingston states as part of our business reopening to increase the frequency of cleaning at, to at least twice a day, especially high touch surfaces. Uh, for example, toilets, light switches, as this is more specific than sanitary condition. I'm assuming that we should follow uh, this higher standard as the local public health unit to at least twice a day. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great yeah. question, David. Um, and I, I know other organizations and other ministries, they've put together, they call them uh, enhanced cleaning protocols uh, for, for addressing uh, situations around COVID. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, the, the, like I think I would, I would suggest that that, that would be at least, uh, be a minimum, uh, yeah. in terms of, uh, increasing it to, to that higher standard of, uh, at least twice a day. Yeah. And I would add to Rob's comment, uh, Public Health Ontario, um, has a lot of, uh, re uh guidance documents mm -hmm. that relate yeah. to things, um, like the cleaning. And I believe it does mention the twice a day and has some specificity there as and it had public health also has other similar documents for physical distancing and uh, for masking so that's public health ontario um, next question 
uh, was um, from Donald Moore a comment. Museums are not attractions. They are mm. nonprofit educational institutions and uh, the distinctions made because of funding. So thank you that, for that, Donald. Uh, Rhonda, the province provides a template for the safety plan. So um, yes, do access that at uh, the Ontario um, website under the Ministry of Labour. So that is in the chat and we'll make sure it's in the last page of the presentation, uh, the, uh, the links to the various resources like the Ministry of Labour's um, safety plan. And okay. uh, yep. the... I guess uh, da, 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 the next question uh, from Jordan, does the mask exemption relate to performing, rehearsing? Um, does it also apply to giving a presentation? Uh, I assume that means uh, like a PowerPoint presentation like we're doing today, maybe in front of uh, individuals or sort of in a class setting. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction. Uh, it, it doesn't, the regulation doesn't, doesn't speak to uh, presentations like in a learning lecturing type uh, of environment, like say at college or university. Um, so again, like that's why, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that in terms of there is a section that talks about uh, training and if we were, for example, to go into an organization to do training, we would still have to abide by the mask requirement. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so yeah. I, I think yeah. a per performance um, and live performance um, does have its own definition and part of the step uh, three does address live performance. Um, also, there is um, a Section 21 committee in the province that guides the entertainment industry, and they actually have their own COVID guideline on the Ministry of Labor's website that they would follow. Um, so we would want to ensure that um, if they are performers, they're going to follow those guidelines. But if it's just in our own um, museum and we're doing a presentation uh, to um, to our clients or to our fellow staff members, um, the, the masking requirement may fall under the general and museum guidance that's already provided. Uh, that would be my take, Rob, on it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I, I'm just looking at the, the Q&A. There's been a couple of others that have come in. Uh, David, um, okay, we talked about that one. Uh, now, Victor um, has has asked here, uh, we of course have adopted a booking system whereby visitors have to book a time slot in advance. As a small museum, we aren't that busy and only about half our time slots are filled. Does anyone have any thoughts about what to do if there is an empty time slot at the time a visitor comes up to the door? Now with that one, Victor, is it, if a visitor comes up to the door, the, 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 the purpose of the, the, uh, the booking system or the reservation is for contact tracing. So I would suggest it's no different than when I go to a restaurant now and I don't have a reservation, but they ask me at the door for my name and contact information. So I would suggest that if a visitor comes up to the door and you have available space, get their, get their contact information you know, name, phone number, things like that. That, Like that's the whole kind of point behind uh, the, the, um, uh, the requirement for the reservation when it comes to COVID. D does that help you, Victor? I don't know if he can unmute or not. Because he has another one here too. Uh, well, I appreciate the need for air filtration systems. Uh, I imagine there are very few museums that have the financial resources to upgrade their systems. Uh, is the government of Ontario providing any financial support? That's a great question, Victor. I have no idea. I, I don't know. It, Janice and I don't work for the, for the provincial yeah. government. You know, we, we work for a, a health and safety association that's somewhat associated with <laughs> the provincial government, but mm -hmm. any, any of those kind of, of decisions, uh, that's that yeah i i, I don't and, know and i would add to that um when we look at uh, health and safety 
um, for any hazard and also COVID, we look at the hierarchy of controls. We look at multiple layers of controls and that's um, why we have multiple public health measures. Um, so you want to ensure you're doing all of those other um, public health measures. But if you do have a concern because you're in an, an older farmhouse building and maybe you can't open the windows or you've had some indoor air quality complaints, enlisting an expert to help provide more information yeah, on, on your indoor air quality and the options um, would be a, a good way to go. The portable units, um, Public Health Ontario responded to that because of requests and, and they did research and then provided the um, resource document on the website um, to help answer some of the questions around the purpose of them. And, um, and also if you're going to choose um, a portable unit, here's some guidance. Hmm. Um, there is one question related to that around, um, are they the same portable units that are being used in schools? So um, yes, the yes and no. Um, I don't wow. know what the manufacturer, you know, um, yeah. uh, you know which unit it is, uh, but that is the same, the purpose. They've done a risk assessment, looked at areas where, um, they uh, don't have as good an indoor air quality, not the same number of air exchanges or the same possibility for um, good filtration. And then the board has used the expertise of an occupational hygienist to determine which classrooms um, and which areas of the schools would benefit from portable units in order to maintain better air quality for the long time that they're in the building, right? Um, while yep. complying with the other measures. There's one other comment here uh, on the Q&A from Beverly. Uh, she is saying that our museum has two outdoor attractions that we have not opened due to cleaning requirements and distancing. One is a lookout tower and the other is a tugboat where self tours uh, were available. Any recommended actions that would make it appropriate to open these spaces safely? Um, I don't know, like, Mary, are people able to actually uh, unmute themselves? Because Beverly, I, I'd, I'd like some more information on this one in terms of like why you, they, these attractions have not been opened because of cleaning requirements and distancing. Is, is it a staffing issue? Because if, if you can comply with the cleaning requirements uh, and the distancing, oh, sorry, it looks like you're coming online there. Uh, yeah, I believe, um, Beverly, uh, I, I think uh, my colleague Chris has provided you mic access if you want to clarify the question. Okay. Uh, we are a small museum and um, the attractions aren't located on site. They're probably about a kilometer away from the museum. And usually what we would do is provide a keypad access as part of the museum um, admission fee. And people would be welcome to go up at their at their leisure. So um, the town policy kind of restricted us from opening them um, yeah, last year for obvious reasons, but this year yeah. we still wanted to maintain that precaution. So I, and we, we like I mentioned, we're um, a small museum. Uh, right. I have, there's two permanent staff and two um, students and that's it. Okay. All right, so the resistance is coming from your municipality then? Yes, but if there was something that, um, you know, that we could, uh, some measures that we might be able to implement, I would love to be able to offer that uh, experience to our visitors. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a different, difficult one. Actually, Beverly, if, uh, if I can get your contact information, maybe from Mary or something like that, maybe we can chat offline. Sure. Are you okay with that? Yep. Okay. Just because I think it's a little bit more complicated than just put out hand sanitizer, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's a question okay. from Jamie. Uh, in the chat, uh, you mentioned that an employer volunteer experiencing symptoms at work must be segregated or isolated, then sent home, but not on public transit. What if they do not have their own private transportation? How do we handle right that? Where was it? Isolated. Yeah. 
Yeah, like, yeah, those are the, that's what the requirements are. If they don't have their own private transportation. They, that That's an interesting, uh, that's a very interesting point. Um, because typically it's not the employer's responsibility to arrange transportation for uh, employees to and from work. Um, I'm just thinking out loud. You know what, uh, Jamie, th that's another one that, uh, can Janice and I get back to you on that one? Is, is, is that okay? Janice, I don't know if you have any yep. thoughts on that or not. Um, I'm not sure whether you can um, call uh, um, how Uber and uh, the taxi industry are, well, are handling those situations. You may um, be able to provide them with information with regards to the concern that somebody may have sure. symptoms and they may have their own protocols in place well, to see, um, yeah. and, and, and for that. The, yeah, yeah, the, and that, yeah. that's what I was thinking. However, the, the question then may become who's going to pay for it. That's true. Right. So it's an interesting one. We'll have to get back to you. Sorry about that one. This is a very fluid situation. <laughs> You're changing all the time. All right. Is, um, uh, is there anything else there? I'm just scanning through. Again, if anybody wants to unmute and answer, ask a question, um, we're happy to do that as well. Uh, we will provide a, a list okay. of uh, resources and some additional links in the presentation for the various uh, authorities, yeah. as well as um, a copy of the presentation that was mentioned in the chat. So you will we'll get a copy of the presentation and um, contact information for us and PSHSA. Okay. And uh, just scanning through here. Well, Mary, I think can we've I... addressed all the questions in the chat there, Rob. I, I, th I think we've looked at them, yeah. Just haven't, there's a couple that need some follow-up. So Mary, um, if, if you receive any uh, additional mm -hmm. comments or questions following this, please forward them on to, to Janice and myself and, uh, and we'll get back. Uh, Beverly Cochran uh, is one, um, if, if she'd like to, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I didn't give my contact information. Um, <laughs> Well, we can, we can we put can it in the slide. Yeah, and we can certainly um, share your contact information in our sort of follow-up email that we're sending to all the participants. Fantastic. Please um, do. Please do. Yeah, and okay. I can certainly yeah. make sure to connect you with uh, Beverly and Jamie about those specific questions as well. Okay. Um, and as Marie mentioned in the chat, that's fine. You know, if, the, okay. if the responses are of interest to to the broader audience, we can we can share their, them more broadly as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for uh, <laughs> for your presentation, for, for taking all of the questions. It certainly is, um, yeah, a lot to uh, to take in and a lot to consider. Um, but I think it's it's been really helpful to have you break it down for everybody. So thank you for that. That's wonderful. That's great to hear. Thank you very much for inviting both of us. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you. All right. Thanks very um, much. Yeah, and thank you everybody for participating participating today um, for your questions, for your attention. Um, as they mentioned, if, you, if you'd like to follow up with anything, um, you can connect with me, but I'll also be sharing Rob and Janice's um, direct information as well. Um, just a few sort of wrap up announcements before we get going. Um, I want to uh, remind everybody that we have call for proposals out right now um, for our professional development series um, which we're looking at for the rest of the year this year. It's sort of a year long series that will explore the theme of, theme of decision making in the museum present and future. Um, and we'll feature some member check ins and additional webinars designed with input from the community in, in response to members evolving needs and priorities. Um, and so the first deadline for, um, for that call for proposals is tomorrow. And I'm putting the link to that in the chat. Um, but absolutely, if uh, you have any um, any ideas about a proposal, anything you're looking to see, um, and even if you can't 
make that deadline of tomorrow, please do reach out and we can we can talk about opportunities as we go forward. Um, I also want to mention that we have another webinar on our schedule, um, a webinar about human-centered design and creative problem solving with Overlap Associates. So we have additional information um, about that coming in the next couple of weeks, but it's just kind of a save the date for August 31st, which is a Tuesday at 10 a.m. Um, so mark that on your calendars and we'll let you know when registration opens. And as you know, this webinar has been offered free of charge as a service to the community during what are very challenging times for everybody as organizations and individuals. So if you're able, there are some things that you can do to help support the OMA um, to continue providing timely and accessible resources. So if you're already a member, thank you very much. Um, but please do renew your membership when you receive an email reminder. Um, if you are not a member, consider becoming one, um, either as an institution or an individual. Um, you can find information about the member categories and benefits on our website. Or just consider making a donation to the OMA on our website or through Canada Helps. Um, your support of the OMA and your participation in events like this um, make us stronger as a sector and we appreciate each and every one of you, so thank you so much. And when you leave the webinar, you'll be directed to a short evaluation form where you can let us uh, know how we did today and what you'd like to see more of. Um, so your responses to these are of great value to us. So please do take a minute to, uh, to complete that. So once again, thank you so much for, um, for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.